Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the highlight of the Rugby League calendar. It's Christmas Day for Rugby League fans, academics and historians. Welcome to the wonderful Peter Shamarasol. Before we start, my call to the uh, stage our three panel members. We're fortunate indeed to have such a quality panel and a qualified group to discuss the issue at hand. So please welcome, if you would, as I make way to the stage. Um, firstly, Karen Stewart, uh, who had an outstanding career uh, that saw her represent Queensland and the Jillaroos, and uh, she's become a renowned coach and mentor in the women's game at both club and representative level. Uh, Matt Parrish, who also had a distinguished playing career. Um, with the Tigers, Matt has coached club and representative teams in the Bush as well as the Samoan team that reached the 2002 Rugby League World Cup final. He currently oversees development pathways in the Bush for the New South Wales Rugby League. Have a seat. Yeah, I won't bite. And lastly, Jeff Mann, a veteran journalist uh, with Dubbo Newspapers and ABC Regional Radio. He's covered rugby league and all sports in Western New South Wales for several decades and is widely respected for his contribution to the region's sporting community. Please make them more welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Do I need that microphone, Jeff? Or? OK. Our subject tonight is Rural Rugby League and the heading with a bush footy is an obvious pun on the direction and state of the game outside of Sydney. When we talk bush footy, it's important to note that it's not just one generic institution. There are big difference with differences between Grafton and Grenfell, Ballina and Bathurst, Wagga Wagga and Wollongong. Some of the coastal areas are doing okay, but it seems to be a struggle west of the aptly named Great Dividing Ridge. Support for rugby league outside the metropolitan areas has been an issue since 1908, and the Sydney centrists Sydney-centric focus of the game still continues, although these days it spreads its tentacles wider through the 17 NRL club franchises. But at the top level, their focus is on their competition and opportunities in Las Vegas, rather than what's going on in Lismore or Lockhart. Undoubtedly, there have been massive changes in rural society since the halcyon days of Eric Weissel and Wally Prigg, etc., such as the demise of railways compared to cars when towns were built around the local train station and there were no freeways. Um, the mechanisation of farms with less labour, uh, changing populations, the size and shape of modern families, the demographics and ethnicity in the towns that make up uh, the rural um, landscape. The changing social recreations too, we have pay TV, we have t uh, pay TV in a thousand channels, most of it showing rubbish, uh, and the internet is and internet's always a, were, um, available, so the world is only a click away, even in Binaway. Uh, and the sporting and recreational diet of meat and three veg is now a veritable smorgasbord with gluten-free options. Uh, we have an easier lifestyle than those 100 or 50 years ago, and yet seem time poor. It's almost as hard to recruit volunteers and officials as it is players at several clubs. And whilst these are not just rugby league problems, it, we now have to compete with the rise and ongoing presence of other sports. There is still talent emerging, but there are so many options now for gifted young athletes. So I asked the panel to start with, is that a fair summation? Is league dead or dying in the bush? Karen, we'll start with you if we can. You can use that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's dying. I think that um, when you have a look at the talent that's coming from the country areas, even into the metropolitan areas to play footy, or the you know country um, teams that are being pulled together for representative footy, um, I think it shows that there's a clear indication that um, you know country rugby league is alive. I think statistics currently show, the information I was given today is the statistics show that country rugby league numbers in terms of participation, regardless of you know, gender or age, have, have increased in 2023. Um, so I don't think, no, I don't think it's dying. Matt, what's your perspective? Oh, no, I don't think it's dying either. Again, um, you know, participation numbers are up, but obviously uh, the ladies game and the girls got a lot to do with that. But I think, you know, demographically, you know, there's no less percentage players playing in the country as there are in the city. Um, you know, you, you touched on a lot of points there. There's plenty of other sports involved at the moment. Um, obviously, you know, with the changing uh, demographics with, you know, internet, you know, um, pay TV, Netflix, all that. So, you know, there's plenty of options uh, for, you know, young, young, young kids now, rather than, you know, like, you know, when I'm sure when most of us all grew up, whether we lived in the city or in the country, you come home um, as a young man, you, as a young boy, you, you play cricket in the summer with your neighbours and play footy with your, uh, in the winter, you know, rather than go in front of the TV. And that's how I grew up. 
Um, I was very lucky. I grew up in the city, but obviously uh, my father's and mum and dad are both from Dubbo. Um, so I'm very passionate about the country as I am the city. But um, I think that, uh, you know, if you look historically, um, you know, you know the country rugby league players have supplied something like 40, you know, up to 43, 45% of uh, rugby league players in the NRL at times. Mm. That, that number may have dropped slightly, but it'd still be around the 40% mark if you think of where it is now. Um, obviously with the emergence, you know, you know, probably uh, 30 years ago there were no Polynesians in our game. Now, um, you know, there's up to, you know, 49, 50% of, of, of our uh, NRL players are Polynesian. If you go out to, you know, um, Penrith and, um, and, you know, Parramatta, you know, uh, West, out, um, out west, you know, in their junior reps, you know, it's full of uh, Polynesian players, good or bad, you know what I mean? But if you go through the uh, country areas, you know, 16s, 18s, in the Johns and Daly competitions, you know, it's predominantly uh, full of, you know, young white girls. So it's just the demographics of where people live. But I, I think, uh, you know, obviously there's challenges in the city in regards to clubs, and there's challenges in the, um, in the in the regional New South Wales in regards to uh, numbers too. Jeff, yeah, what do you think? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you talk about the reasons why rugby league was dying. I think contraception was one of the big ones. Uh, <laughs> because back in the day, families had eight or ten and farms would have their own community and then uh, they'd have workers on the farm. So you had little tiny communities like Leadville out near Dunny Do, uh, Spices Creek, would have a, a rugby league team. Now, that population's not there, and Matt touched on it, changes in, and, and you were saying, changes in technology on farms. Instead of having 10 people um, working the canals out in the cotton farms, now you're down to one person. Instead of having people driving tractors 24-7, farmers are, are operating, some of them, the wealthy ones, uh, computer-driven. And uh, I think that's the case. But I, I sought out, before I came down tonight, just some stats uh, from... Uh, Tim Delgozzo, who's our Rugby League Development Officer. And uh, he's saying that for the first time this year, uh, the Western Rams, as they're called now, but the Western Division, has reached over 10,000 players. Now, some would say that's because of the introduction of, of females. Uh, and they account for roughly 28% of participants. 25% are registered female tackle participants. So we've got a, a female tackle comp coming up. But it's also with the males and with not only kids, but older males. They've introduced, for example, a reserve grade competition in the Castle Ray League, which is a lot of the small towns, Gilgandra, Dunedoo, Coolar, Coonabarabran, Canamble, Baradine, those communities, and Cobar who travel 10,000 k's a year. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, and they've, yeah. they've introduced that as a means of keeping people in the game a bit longer. They don't want to play every week. Uh, but they want to continue. And of course Dubbo uh, or Western uh, Rams um, consider themselves as the Western Panthers because for 30 years we've been supplying players. In fact, you go right back to the very first year that the Panthers came in, a bloke by the name of um, Wayne Peckham played for the Panthers. Mm. Uh, so there's been this continual, and last week the St John's kids who have been a, a real nursery uh, Isaiah Yo and Matt Burton and these blokes that have come through and they came down out to Penrith where uh, you're working and those kids were surrounded by other kids from out west, from Forbes and Parks and Orange and mm. Bathurst uh, who've come into there. So I don't think it's dying out home and uh, League Tag and now League Tackle that's about to come on but League Tag, uh, they had a massive crowd for under 12s 14s and 17s, and it was bigger than a whole day of the boys played the next day. So we're very happy with the way it's going, and I'll talk about some of the reasons why a little later on. And uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your opening um, paragraph about last week at Boorua and Crookwell. Well, I know people have travelled all over the state 
to go to see Boorua in their first grand final for 40 years and they're not rolling bales of wool down the British streets of Boorua this week, they're, they're rolling kegs of beer. Uh, similarly, Cobar came down to play gold golf. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. two tiny little towns, one way out west, 10,000 k's, and Golgong, the town on the $10 bill. And Golgong won, and I understand, are the only unbeaten team in country New South Wales. So, no, I wouldn't say league's dying, and uh, any community that uh, loves Souths, and if Souths isn't your first team, they're your second team, and all those western communities, uh, with the, the lifeline into Sydney, uh, so many of the uh, Aboriginal players, so many brilliant Aboriginal players from Ricky Walford down uh, have maintained that and I don't think they're going to be swapping to soccer or anything else uh, too quickly. Uh, there are undoubtedly problems though in some areas. Um, uh, I see the, the numbers in Wollongong haven't been great and there's uh, some issues there that are still going on with the rule pulling out of the, the President's Cup. Um, there's ongoing issues down in Group 9 in the Riverina. Um, so it's not all roses everywhere, no. is it? Oh, definitely not. I wouldn't think so, Matt. No, no, I can, uh, well, I can comment on the Illawarra. Obviously, that's probably uh, been a rugby league stronghold for a number of, like, generations, or well, not generations, or decades. But, you know, the problem there is, again, there's self-interest in clubs there. Like, there's a couple of rich clubs there, Collegians and West, for example. What they've gone, done is gone and bought all the good young kids, um, you know, 18-year-olds, um, from um, their clubs, from the other clubs, and um, th what they've done is they've weakened, weakened those clubs, and s some have folded. And uh, like you know, no one wants to play in a team that gets pumped every week by 50 points. You want to have compete. You want to be able to compete, or be able to you know have a chance of winning. Um, so I think that's really disappointing what's happened in Illawarra now. But if you go just a little bit further south than that, and you've got Group Seven, well that competition's thriving. Mm. And if you go west. In Group Six, they've amalgamated with, Macqu uh, with um, MacArthur League, and that's another competition that's thriving because, again, you know, obviously southwestern Sydney is a growing population. There's, uh, you know, new estates popping up everywhere around Camden and all that, and that is a big area, both uh, for the male and female area. So there's always reasons why, you know, there's challenges in uh, clubs, but I think a lot of it goes back to self-interest and uh, and people that are looking uh, at their own club and their own self-interest rather than the big picture, which I think that's what, um, you know, being part of you know, New South Wales Rugby League and, and CRL before that, that's part of our job was to look at the big picture all the time. I mean, not just look at um, um, self-interest in, in clubs, but, you know, you touched on it before, you know, working at a club and being a volunteer, that's really important because without those volunteers, we haven't got footy clubs, you know, and it's sometimes it's a thankful task, thankless task, sorry. You know, and it's uh, tough work. And I really take my hat off to, uh, you know, volunteers that uh, work at clubs, you know, and especially the ones, you know, it's always good when, you know, if you're winning in that, but the ones that aren't winning and they still turn up every week, they work the canteen, they work the gate, you know, and they're, um, you know, and they're, they're the lifeline of rugby league because without the volunteers, you know, we haven't got the uh, pathways that are coming through. What do you think, Karen? Too many problems? that you can identify? You think there's, uh, everything's... I'll share you. Uh, I'll try, I'll get that microphone there. Um, do you think that everything's going okay? Hunky and Dory? Um, You're on. Oh, well, yeah. well, the part... That one too. The, the, the part that I have to do with, I don't see... I mean, I agree with what Matt's saying. I mean, you know, I grew up with a father that played footy. You know, he started down in the Illawarra region and played for old Dapdo and... Then went down to Nara and then up to the Southern Highlands and, you know, then uh, played through Group 6 and a number of clubs there. But, you know, the footy, the footy back then, I think, was... I don't know that the numbers were necessarily greater than what they are now. Um, I think the sport's grown as much as, you know, the mm. demographic around who plays the game. Um, but I, I agree, I think, you know, volunteers are vitally important. We went out to games, to finals games out at Picton um, mm. on the weekend. There was male and female games there and there were volunteers everywhere. And those games wouldn't have been able to run without those efforts from those people. But that was thriving and we're out in Picton, you know. Uh, there was heaps of people there and um, heaps, of, heaps of games. You talk about NARA, um, 
and that's a town that used to have um, two or three teams, but I think they're down to one now. Um, and Roy Masters did a recent article, um, you may have seen in the Herald, about the state of rugby league in Tamworth, which was formerly such a stronghold um, with the Peel um, River knockout, etc., which um, has gone by the wayside, and um, a lot of the local clubs have gone by the wayside. Tamworth previously had three teams, they're down to one. Um, there was a bit of a fracas, I think, with the, uh, the West Tamworth team that got uh, them kicked out a few years ago, but. Mm. Uh, which was a shame because they've got such a wonderful facility there at Scully Park. Um, but yeah, obviously there are some ongoing issues. Just on the Group 4, when COVID was on, um, Jeff, you touched on it before, um, that Group 4, obviously they couldn't conduct their normal competition, but they did come up with a novel way of um, trying to still supply rugby league. Do you remember what happened there? Yeah, I think they uh, combined a couple of groups and they introduced smaller uh, towns and then they went to having gala days where there might be two or three teams. You go back to the days when Narrabri and Moree were really strong. Gunnedah, you mentioned the three teams from from there and Warrialda, they were all playing in that comp and there was Group 4, there was Group 19 and uh, Group 21 which sort of bordered back down onto Musselbrook and Singleton, Denman, Merriwar, that area. Uh, they had to think outside the square and that's pretty much what's happened, say, with the Castle Ray League. Uh, you've got teams in that now, like Cobar, who played in every comp in the, in the area. They've played in the old Group 15, which was out west. They've played in the Barwon Darling. they played in Group 11 and won Group 11 in 1998. As I said, they won that under Scott Meaney and were the uh, Clayton Cup winners. Uh, and uh, then they've now come into the Castle Ray League. Well, the enthusiasm that that's re reignited. Narromine was going away and they'd come home and they'd be happy if someone had scored a try. You know, now Narromine was the winningest most in Group 11. And when you think of David Gillespie, you think of Ross Cale, Bob Weir, who was a state mm. centre, in this community that lived and died, Pat Smith, mm. who played country, and Captain South, um, for them not to have rugby league and, and not be winning. So they went to the Castle Ray League. They won the reserve grade last year, which was only a four-week comp. They've just won the girls. One thing I don't like, Karen, is the fact that all the uh, teams now have, are called Ets. There's the Jets and the Jetettes and the Swans and the Swanettes. I don't know why they just aren't part of the Dunny Doo Swans or the Narromine Jets, but that's irrespective. They won that the other day. And to see smiles on faces of people with rugby league. They don't have to win every week, they don't have to win every game. But just to be playing the game and getting together. It's very reassuring to hear that um, the connection between the game and community is as strong as ever out in those uh, communities. Um, and I don't think anyone doubts that. Anyone who's watched, uh, for example, the, the Koori Knockout, I think that shows perhaps a, a way forward where you see that some of those smaller towns can still provide um, unbelievable numbers of players for the teams. and. Places like Bellbird, etc., etc. All uh, they have, um, to, and uh, everyone wants to play in it because the community and what it represents means something to them. Well, if you if you go to any of those knockouts, whether it's the Koori Knockout or the Murray Carnival up in Queensland, they have people coming from everywhere just because they love the sport. You know, it's not about anything else because they're certainly not about you know coming down and you know drinking and partying because it's usually alcohol free those kinds of things. So it's actually just about mm. the community and the sport and. You know, each one of those carnivals keeps growing every year where their participation around the country communities coming in to play footy keeps growing. Yeah, I just thought that I, I think that's a very valid point. You, you talk about the Koori um, carnivals and Murray carnivals in um, Queensland, you know, but what happens there is a lot of NRL players and like big name ones, because it means so much to them, they go back to the communities and play. And if you think back uh, in country rugby league, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, like, you know, my father, when he finished playing at West, he went captain coach uh, West in uh, Millawarra. You know, and then you had John Raper went to Curry, for example. So, like, uh, Noel Kelly, he went into the country and captain coach. But that doesn't happen now, not with the big names or internationals, because, well, probably because they earn too much money, they can earn too much money playing one more game, in, you know, mm. for their city club. But, like... In those days, like it was nothing for kangaroos or Australian players or state players to go back and captain coach in the country. And that's what, you know, attracts, you know, you talk about the Koori knockout. One of the reasons the draw card is because you get a good NRL player or a couple of NRL players go and play 
in those um, for those communities, then everyone jumps on board. One wants to play, and then two, they turn up to watch them play. So I think that's you know you know if the NRL wanted to do something and invest into grassroots rugby you know rugby league or you know regional football or even uh, city football, they should perhaps you know invest in retirement payments for ex NRL players to go back and captain coach in uh, teams because. I've got no doubt that would attract more players into the game. And I think that's been shown uh, out, out our way. <laughs> you talk about in the, uh, the earlier days, Dave Brown, the great Dave Brown, coached in Canemble. He was up past his playing days. Joe Jorgensen went from for Australia out to Mudgee and then went down into the Riverina. Billy Wilson coached uh, Baradine, you know, the great Billy Wilson from St George, because they needed to get money. Ken Thornett came out to the bush. Leo Nosworthy had about eight or nine years with Narromine and Dubbo. And, and uh, Barry Harris, who was a policeman, came out to Dubbo, married and then came back to the city. He played the state from out there. Kenny McMullen, John McDonnell, Keith Outen. You know, the names could go on. And what they brought to the game was, was incredible experience and their inputs back into communities and it fostered a, a love for the game and it took it to another level. And, and even today, if you look at Isaiah Yo, Matt Burton playing down here, um, there's so many, you know, we, we went through Dean Pay, Dave Gillespie, Les Davidson, uh, Ricky Walford, uh, Rambo Gibbs. Like Ronnie Gibbs' input into rugby league is so strong and they love him going out into the communities and they love the knockouts. And um, Karen, I worked in Aboriginal education for 30 years and the, the thrill of the knockout uh, was something that, uh, you know, all, I always found, you know, the Walgut, you know, the, the, and, and the Gate and, uh, and Burke and Engonia where they had the races the other day. People wanted to play and it's much, much more than a football contest. It, it is about community and developing it. And when you see Georgie Rose play a grand final for Manly one day and then drive out to Bathurst when he should have been on, on Mad Monday and play in the knockout out there, like that says to me the love of the game. And, uh, you know, I think there's there, there's things that really hold the, the, the game together. So obviously... Um the whole, we could look at smarter ways of doing things and maybe shorter competitions, different format competitions. But there's obviously some political um, challenges too. Um, there's been an ongoing dispute between the New South Wales Rugby League um, and the NRL, uh, which has restricted funds. The NRL, as I said, seem more focused on uh, Las Vegas uh, rather than uh, the game, the, the grassroots. Um, but also, um, the, the merger between the Country Rugby League and the New South Wales Rugby League um, I think many people still have the jury out on whether that's been a success. Um, if I go back to 1934, the reason, one of the reasons the Country Rugby League was established was A, they wanted their own independence, they wanted to be able to run things, but B, the New South Wales Rugby League was sick of having to meet every Monday night and work out uh, disputes about something that had happened for registration, judiciary, whatever, out in the bush, and that's... The, the wheel has turned completely so that I know the staff at the New South Wales Rugby League are having to do all those sort of things which were previously handled by the CRL and group administration. Mm. Um, so, it, you know, it hasn't been all success. And as I said, some of the, the, the answer is it li may lie, or the, the blame may lie in that dispute between New South Wales and the NRL. I don't know, it, it, is that a fair reading? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 just back on the, I'll start on the merger for a start. Um, obviously, in any merger, it, you know, it's always tough. You know, people's, you know, when you go two into one, someone's jobs have got to go, which is what's happened. But I think, um, generally speaking, it's been reasonably positive. And I think, uh, while I understand what you're saying there, Terry, about, um, you know, about people going and about judiciaries and all that, but you'll find that each region now, has all has got their own like employee from New South Wales Rugby League that runs the region. You brought up Tim Galzian, mm. who's a, done done a fantastic job in that in that Western region. Peter Clark was before him, yeah. so they're all they're all still regional people and they're still regionally based. But right now we're reporting to, uh, to one body in the state, which I, I think is a, a good thing. Like you know, you look at QRL, that's got one body up there. Now we've got two body or one body down here, which is the, which is the right way to go. I think, um, you know, I think 
there's no doubt more funding has to go to grassroots and it's got to come from the NRL because, you know, they're making, they are making phenomenal amounts of money now through TV rights and all that sort of stuff and you can't just keep giving it to the top end all the time, which is what happens. And when you give it to the top end, it goes to the top end players. So it doesn't go to the number 30 in your roster. It usually goes to, to number one, two and three and props up their wage. Um, but, like, you know, um, you know, the blue between New South Wales and, uh, and the NRL is probably more about personalities with Peter Valandis, you know. Well, he's done some magnificent job, job in uh, racing and he did a great job in, um, you know, keeping, keeping uh, rugby league going during COVID. You know, I think he's he definitely uh, got some flaws in some of his uh, views. You know, and I think he's, you know, it's either his way or the highway. And I don't think he's been in the game long enough to um, to, to have the dominant show that he has. You know, and I think he's probably know, got more experience than the CEO. Well, correct. <laughs> but he put the CEO in there, and again, you know, we've got a commission that's probably, you know, one person really. He's the one that makes all the decision, even though there's a, there is a commission. You know, and I think guys like, you know, you know, we've got a guy like Wayne Pearce who's, uh, you know, been around rugby league all his life, you know, I think he needs to have more of a say and he needs to stand up more, you know, and I think, you know, if you, like it or not, there's been some good changes to rugby league and there's been some ordinary ones. Um, you know, you watch a game of rugby league in the NRL now, it goes for like two hours, you know, I think it goes for way too long, you know, so some of the things that I understand technology and all that comes in, but... I think the biggest problem between the NRL and New South Wales Rugby League is his personality and his uh, failure to negotiate or, or, you know, to take advice from other people that know more about the game than he does. And it's not just about that either. I mean, he, he also played a pivotal part in the delay in the agreements with the players as well, which really isn't 100% resolved either. So I think he probably has a lot to answer for in, in, in a lot of ways. Jeff, what's your, your reading on the manager? Oh, well, I think that uh, I agree with Matt. Country Rugby League, and I remember Jock Colley, who was the chair for a lot, lot of years, and Frankie Fish, Manny Fish from Narrabri, and, and uh, Big John from um, South Newcastle. Uh, Straw, uh, yeah. John Anderson. Anderson, John. Yeah, Jock. And all of those people, you know, John O'Toole back in the day from Bathurst and then down south, they would fight for country. They would go and do it passionately. And I don't dispute that somebody like Peter Clark isn't going to do it, but you are limited because it's not yours. And that, that's probably something that comes up a lot with people, that they're saying that the decisions are not being made by the grassroots people. Uh, the input is not necessarily there. Uh, you know, the converse of that is is that, that there are a few more development officers now. We've got female development officers, and we're only talking about one who's started in Dubbo, uh, you know, less than 12 months ago, but is just passionate about rugby league. And uh, she's doing game management and, and looking at ways of, of expanding it. But there's no doubt when you get somebody from the city, you've only got to go to Kennard Park in Wellington and see what impact Blake Ferguson has had in that community, not necessarily on the field, he's done some good things, but the kids just flock around him, they just want to be there. Um, and, you know, anyone that's played NRL and comes to the bush, even if it's just for the weekend or a day, or they just love it, they just want to be around them. Yeah, just on that, you make a very valid point, you talk about John Anderson, well he's the, he's the um, Vice Chair of the, of the New South Wales Board, and, and the New South Wales Board is currently made up of seven members, uh, Three from the city, three from the country. John Anderson, Terry Brady, Bob Walsh from Group Ten, Group 10, oh, sorry, 11. Eleven, sorry. Yep, Terry from uh, Down River Runaway, and there's uh, three city um, people. Joe Kelly from the Roosters is one, and then we've got an independent chair in Paul Common. Okay, and then uh, we our CEO Dave Trodden. So there is there is plenty of voice from the country on, on our board, and uh, you know, and if you look. What's happened with the you know the dispute between New South Wales Rugby League and the NRL? The country guys were the ones that stood rock solid behind New South Wales Rugby League in the uh, you know in the so-called blue, and that's what happened. Went to court, got thrown out. New South Wales won, which you know doesn't get uh, you know doesn't get probably announced where it should be because of the agenda you know that uh, Peter Volandis has with uh, News Limited. With all due respect, though, like. 
lot of the people out on the, the um, who are on the front, out and you know in junior league level or in country rugby league land, they don't give a damn about the fight between the personalities or about who's right and who's wrong. The impact is what they've got to deal with, isn't it? Um, and um, the whole the land is going to wanting to go to Las Vegas. I can understand that doing that might grow the financial footprint of the game. My question is, how is that going to benefit individual clubs and in your in the bush areas? Well, again, I'll go back to, uh, again, I agree. They've gone to, uh, to uh, Vegas, obviously, to uh, improve the financial position of the, uh, you know, the NRL and to grow the game, so-called, hopefully bringing more funds into the game. But again, the funds need to be channeled back into grassroots footy. You can't just keep going to NRL clubs and can't keep going to NRL players. Like, you know... Or NRL, NRL executives. Clubs, yeah, or NRL executives. <laughs> like, the NRL clubs now, they get 130% the salary cap. So the salary cap's 10 million, which it is, they get 100, they get 13 million, plus money they generate for sponsors, gates and all that. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money that they can generate. But like, you know, the actual money going back into, you know, you talk about volunteers, about training, about, you know, educating coaches is something I'm very passionate about, particularly in country rugby league and uh, regional rugby league because they haven't got the access to NRL clubs as the city clubs have. Because again, like Penrith do a fantastic job, Parramatta, educating their coaches, okay, um, in uh, their junior reps program. But like again, you go out to group 10 and 11, it's not the access there. But Penrith have done an amazing job out in Western, um, mm -hmm. regional Western uh, country. So group 10 and 11, for example, they've, uh, they do coaching clinics, they uh, educate the coaches. So what's happened there is in, over the last uh, probably 10 years, They've saturated that area with Penrith, you know, apparel like with uh, coach, like school clinics for kids, not just elite kids, but all kids mm. in the school holidays and that. Penrith have done it. So what they've done is they've saturated the area with gear. So anyone in that western region now, particularly young people, like while they might, you know, if their dad goes for St George, they go for St George or the Rabbitohs or Penrith or whatever. Well, because again, what's happened now is all the young kids, so they they might go for the South like their father, but they see that much Penrith gear out there, they think, well, well I'm going to go for Penrith. So Penrith's everyone's second team out in, in Western in Western um, New South Wales, and they've done a really good job out there. Phil Gould and Matt Cameron, Phil Gould set it up with Matt Cameron, and then Matt Cameron's obviously driven it from there, um, you know. And they've done it. And what we've done, we we've used that blueprint in other regions in. Uh, in New South Wales, so that we've got NRL clubs now that are associated with all other regions in New South Wales. So there's pathways for young men and young women to uh, to get to NRL clubs, which is what they all aspire to be. Well, it's good to see they're not all uh, carrying around AFL bags and backpacks and that sort of rubbish. Well, um, that's, a, that's a challenge down in Riverina because again, they've invested heavily in the um, facilities in Riverina. Um, um, the AFL and they, they have and they do put a lot of money back into their uh, grassroots program, you know. And that, you know, again, that's well, they can't they can't invest in their international program and not just say that for no, no, um, because that so they've got to be seen to try and grow their game, you know, like and you know, like uh, more power to them for that, you know, like but it's not just um, it's not just a, a versus AFL because soccer, particularly, particularly on the back of the Matilda's success and um. I don't think, don't think we have to worry about the Wallabies uh, doing anything, but uh, <laughs> other, other sports as well, though, you know, like the rise of those inspires children to, to follow suit. So, you know, it's not just, as I said, like or as you said too, Matt, you know, the cricket in the summer and um, rugby league in the winter these days. Um, yeah, but, that, but young people don't do that now because there's so many other options yeah. they can do. Yeah. Like, again, they can go, they can jump on an Xbox and play someone in Germany on like a, you know, whatever. There's so many more options now. Yeah. Yeah. Where like when we grew up, it was either sport, or sport, mm. you know what I mean, and, that, and that's it's just the way of changing times. One of the um, things I thought about in the lead up to this to tonight was that back in 1994, uh, for the only time ever, there was an Australian residence rugby league team, mm. uh, which combined guys who weren't uh, part of the NRL and grade system, but we had guys from the Metro Cup, we had guys from country New South Wales, we had guys from Queensland uh, who all played, and I always thought that it was a shame that that was allowed to die during the Super League War because I think that is the the model and the, the, the structure you could use to give incentive to kids in Western Australia, in all those states that don't play the game, but also in bush towns. I mean, how good would it be to have a guy in the Australian residence team from 
narrow mind mm. from you know uh, anywhere and, and it's like they get a buzz out of that when the, the kids doing it at any level it's Australian schoolboys level but I really think that that is something that if the NRL or whoever if they get together that is something that really should be looked at well, you do want to represent, don't you? And you want to represent your own area. City country, obviously, uh, has been a, a huge boost. I'll run you through a team of players from the bush. Don Parrish, your dad, he played for New South Wales and Australia whilst he was playing in Dubbo. Johnny King grew up in Gilgandra. Chris Anderson, of course, at Condoblin and Forbes. Bob Weir and Matt Burton, narrow-eyed boy and a Dubbo boy. Barry Rushworth from Lithgow, Andrew Farrer from Cowra. This is a sort of a, a back line that you might pick from. The great Terry Fay, I think, uh, apart from Slippery Morris, the last bloke to represent Australia while he was still playing with his home club. Earl Harrison was from Galagambo. Now, he went to the 63 Kangaroo Tour. Still comes along and sits and watches the footy. Tom Radonikus from, from Cowra. Ronnie Lynch, who would play city country, get on a train, go back, get off at parks, get picked up and driven to Forbes so he could play. Isaiah Yo, of course, came down to Sydney out of juniors, but uh, Cement Gillespie, Rambo Gibbs, Barry Beef, uh, Les Davidson, Dean Pay, Nana Grant, um, the great Ian Walsh. These were all blokes who played football at Yugawa and Bogan Gate and Trangy and uh, you mentioned the residents. Peter Boone was from uh, Wilkenia and came and played in Dubbo, and, and he was the last fullback, I think, in that New South Wales residence. Um, Paul Dunn, Darren Britt, <laughs> reserves. Jack White uh, could be one of those. You know, all country players who did learn in the bush, but if you don't support the clubs to be able to continue on in a really substantial way, then it's not going to happen. Yeah, or Liam Martin's another one. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, that's wild, yeah. But again, it comes back to like it's where when they're growing up, that's when when clubs, sports have got most influence on the young people, and that's uh, you know, and that's where we need to target, you know, when they're you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, growing up that way. But you talk about um, you know, residents and teams like that, and, and I agree to you, like and. People do want to play rep games, and you know, you talk about WA, South Australia, and all that. But the NRL, to their credit, they run they run a ladies uh, under nineteens program, I think it is. Um, and again, city country go up from Queensland and New South Wales represent, and then they they get teams from Northern Territory, WA, uh, Melbourne, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, Victoria, and um, South Australia. They all compete in that. So there is a there is some things happening, particularly in the women's space, because, you know, let's face it, um, the women's game is probably the fastest growing sport, mm. you know, in the country, but there's probably not enough players at the moment or enough quality players coming through. What we do, or what I should say is there is, there's a lot of good quality there, but we need more to underpin it. And the NRL have started at the top, but there's not, they haven't, there's not enough grassroots coming through, but slowly there is and again Western have had a, a good ladies competition for a long t for a while now probably a lot but there's other regions like Riverina that could be strong that need to be there's a, a rugby union competition down there but not a rugby league one Canberra's got a reasonably uh, reasonable ladies competition which Riverina sent one team over but we need these regions to have more and um, North Coast Northern Rivers have got I think a four or six team competition over a couple of weeks and you know, we talk about challenges and different, like what works in one area won't work in another area. But up, for example, Northern Rivers, they play on a, fr on a Friday night um, and it's in summer, okay, and they play uh, four teams, six teams, they all play at one game, uh, one ground. So what happens is there's three games, 20 minutes, 25 minutes each way, okay, and what happens is because all the girls are there, all the guys go there, uh, to one to watch. <coughs> partners, because they probably have to, but they go there to watch the girl, ladies play. But also they all go and have a drink, they have beers, they buy hamburgers. So they're generating some money. And they swap that around to each club to give them all a chance of it. But it, that works. And it works in that region. Now that may not work in Western Sydney or it may not work in, you know, Group 6, but it works in, uh, in Northern Rivers. So, you know, different um, challenges, different areas, but again, you know, it's about trying things, and I think uh, you know we've got some good staff in uh, those regions that are, you know, that really are, have got the best interests of rugby league at heart. Yeah. 
Karen, you hear all this talk, positive talk about women's rugby league and all the green, it's part of the green shoots in, in the growth of the game at the moment, but we had a discussion last year about the state of women's rugby league and I made the point then that um, it's very different to how it was 20, 30 years ago in that a lot of the achievements have been done in spite of head office. Yeah, so I think if you talk about pre the last sort of five, you know, five to ten years where it's, you know, grown exponentially, probably more so over the last five years, you know, 20 years ago, it was nothing like it. So there are a lot of really talented players that came from country areas that couldn't actually represent because they couldn't afford to. Mm -hmm. So I think there still needs to be a fair bit of dough go into those regions to enable people to come in. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot better. It's definitely a lot better. You know, if somebody's identified that lives out, you know, the back of Burke, then they're obviously supported to, you know, come in and represent. But there are a lot more people, though, that could be identified and acknowledged out there if there was more support given to, you know, those communities. And I agree with Matt. One size doesn't fit all. Um, it definitely doesn't, you know, one size does not fit all. And I think you have to look at the demographic and, you know, what's around and those kinds of things. But in terms of the women's game, you know, it is worlds apart. You know, and I would challenge any of these young women today that are playing at the elite level to take a, a step back and think about those kinds of events that would have happened, you know, 10, 15 years mm. ago. So I can remember my first World Cup as a player, I had to sell my car to get there mm. because there was no funding from the Australian Rugby League at the time. It wasn't NRL. So a lot of us had to do things like that to actually go to England to play the first World Cup, you know. And thankfully, that sort of stuff doesn't happen anymore where, you know, women are given more opportunity and more funding and more support. But I do know that there are a lot of people. So we've got a young girl travelling um, from Griffith um, every week to play footy out of Penrith. Um, she'll be in the under-19s website this year, but she travels every week, twice a week, to come up and just play footy. Now, that's a shame that she has to come all this way to be recognised. We've got another young girl, and while Melbourne are developing in their women's sport of, of rugby league through Victoria, we've got another young girl that just came up and participated in the PRLW under-20s for Penrith for the last six months, but she had to relocate from Melbourne to participate mm. and away from her family. You're not just justifying uh, stealing players from all over the place, are you? <laughs> well, we're not stealing, we just put it out there. If we want to talk about stealing, Can you recruit let's, talk about, it? let's talk about roosters going into yeah. the Penrith Territory yeah. and stealing players, because that's happening quite a fair bit. Well, but merely but having a bus that have taken over from Blacktown over to the player. 100%. So I, I do think the women's game is definitely great. And it is, the, it is the largest growing component of rugby league, which is great. Um, I also just want to go back to the point that Matt touched on about the quality um, of players. You do get worried that, you know, they expanded this year uh, in the NRLW, mm. and that's been okay, but I do worry that, you know, over the next course of, you know, every year there's going to be another couple of teams added to the, to the roster, and I'm not sure that the quality going is going to be, be there. there. Yeah. Um, I'd be ner I'm nervous about that myself. Um, as a coach, but, um, you know, I think it's just the way that it's it's going to go and, you know, it'll eventually catch up, I think, where there'll be an, an equal amount. I do want to know, though, why the NRLW is not going to Las Vegas. <laughs> I don't know why it's all men and no women. I don't get that when we're, the, you know, the fastest growing component of the sport and then even internationally, it's the same, you know. The it might be like the Wallaroos, they'd have to travel down the back while the, the blokes are up the front well, and, and uh, whatever we else. We could talk to you about minibuses versus, you know, coaches. Yeah, yeah coaches, yeah. yeah. we could talk about that. Just on the women's, uh, I've got to say, uh, again, we're very blessed out west to have a, a, a person like Jess Skinner who grew up playing rugby league with her brothers and then went into the sport with league tag and into the Western Rams set up. She's now one of the most highly qualified rugby league coaches and she's in, well she was over in Newcastle for some time, she's in um, the uh, Canberra at the Australian uh, Sports um, you know, Commission down there working in rugby league. Now what she's brought back to the community is, is immeasurable. And, and a person like uh, Talisha O'Neill, she is now, but Talisha Quinn, she was, grew up in parks, playing for Australia, coming out and being guested at some of the functions that 
that we were running for the group or just turning up at matches, kids seeing oh, she plays for Australia. You know, that's massive. And, and it goes back to my point that the New South Wales Rugby League and the NRL need to be putting money back into that sort of promotion, getting blokes that are injured out to the bush. Yeah, agreed. And like what we need is some of these young ladies to go back and coach after they finish playing, the ones that are in there now, because that's what the quality is. You know, like, uh, so we, Country Rugby League and then New South Wales Rugby League, we, we run a thing called the Johnson Daily, which is 16s and 18 year olds. So you talk about Western Division now, so everyone wants to be a Western Ram, those kids. So Penrith support that. So we've got um, 10 teams in that competition in those two age groups, 16s and 18s, so this is for boys at the moment. And it costs us about $1.2 million a year to run a five-week five competition with uh, semis and grand final, with bus travel, accommodation, um, you know, getting staff in those regions is very hard, trainers, all that sort of stuff. So what needs to happen, and for the ladies game to, to be underpinned by a strong junior development program, that needs to happen in the ladies game. But it only can happen, one, with funding, and then two, we need to go out and actually resource it with good people, good coaches, good sports <coughs> trainers, good administrators. And it's not that easy, particularly when a lot of them are volunteers and not getting paid for it. You know, and to, to go away for, we run a Johnson Daily competition to run, so what we, the reason that came in was to keep these kids at 16 and 18 at home. Because if you're from a good family, you need to stay at home, finish school, but not be penalised because you can't go to the city. So if you, you need to finish your school because even though everyone wants to be an NRL player, not that many make it. Mm. So you need to have something to fall back on. And the ladies <coughs> need the same, mm. and they will need the same. And the best players at 16 are not the best players at 21, 22, are they? So Definitely yeah. not. But some are, mm. too. Mm. Particularly as long as they've got the right training, the right coaches, the right strength and conditioning program, the right access to gyms, which is easy when you're in the city because you're only 20 minutes or half an hour away from everywhere. But out, you know, in, in, in regional New South Wales, you might be an hour and a half from, some, from the nearest gym. Or if you're from, you know, so that's where the challenges are. But if we've got good people there that will help these young guys and young women to, get, to be successful, that, that's very important. And again, as I said, I'm really, one thing I've learned is like your coaches. You remember your good coaches and you remember your shit coaches. But your good coaches, you know, I remember hearing Wayne Bennett talk uh, probably about 15 years ago when I was like really trying to kick on as a coach. He said, you know what? He goes, you can be a, um, a good coach but a shit bloke and you won't do that well. But he goes, if you're an ordinary coach but a really good bloke, you'll do really well. You know, and he's true. It is. So... so it's the way you communicate, the way you get people to invest into, into what you're trying to do, to buy into what you want to do. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, again, that's why you take your hat off to someone like Ivan Cleary, who's had you know phenomenal success. Like Wayne Bennett, he's a freak to be still coaching now. Like, don't forget, when he started coaching, there was no video, there was no phones. Yeah. You know, he's still he, like he's going five decades later. You know, it's a phenomenal effort. But um, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to get good people in the regions that have access to like uh, technology and, uh, and the modern coaching uh, coaching and administration, because that's important. And as I said, sports trainers, all that. Without them, we can't have games. Referees. I, I think that's right. So I think there needs to be an investment in the coaching aspect out in the country. Because what happens is you often see that you'll get players that come in from the country, whether they're trialling or whatever they're doing, and when you actually start to work with them, you have to actually start from the beginning because what they've been getting out there is not actually making them competitive against what the mm. you know, city metro kids have got access yeah, to in terms of you know, really good coaching. So I think resourcing is part of not just playing the support but definitely around coaching support and being able to you know, update and improve mm. the coaches that are putting their hands up out in the country and, and having a crack. They're just having a crack at it. But I think there's a lot more to it if you want to get those guys coaching kids that are going to be able to come, come down and compete. Um, I might ask one final question before we take a few questions from the floor, as we usually do to finish up. But um, it's very pleasing, I suppose, to hear that it's not all doom and gloom. Um, but we've had COVID and uh, bushfires and floods, all sorts of things in recent years. So 
What do you think the future holds um, in the short term and in the longer term? We'll start with you, Karen. What the future holds for footy? Yeah, yeah, bush footy in particular, I suppose. Well, I think I think there's enormous um, potential to keep growing out in in country. Footy is loved by everybody out in the country. I remember going out to Sherberg one year and we took we took the Gillaroos out to when I was coaching out to Sherberg and we we played um, a couple of possible probables types games and we just took it out to the country and there were people coming from everywhere just male and female, just to watch footy. But then when we left, the feedback we got is that the participation rates for Sherberg out there in their local competitions went through the roof over the next few weeks. So I think, I think you know, if we keep doing those kinds of things, we keep investing, you know, we keep taking footy out to the country rather than trying to bring the country in, I think it's, it's all positive. Yeah, I, I agree. I, like, you know, You've only got to look when you, you get it, take an NRL uh, game to the bush. It's sold out. You know, if you've got the facility there, like a Mudgy, they're sold out. Uh, Tamworth, sold out. So if you've got quality, people will turn up to it. But again, unless you've got the investment in the, uh, you know, as we pointed out, coaches and competitions and all that, you know, it's the same challenges in the city, whether it's uh, regional or, or city. They... they they haven't got as many challenges as, as the regions because of uh, obviously, you know, there's travel you know, challenges around in regional New South Wales. But, you know, you, you brought up a, a great point before about, you know, sizes of families. Like my, my mother, who's from Dubbo, this is my father, but my mother comes from 12, like a family of 12. My dad has eight brothers and sisters. Mm. So that's only my family. But, like, I don't know anyone now that's got. Eight brothers and sisters. <laughs> you know, well, none of my friends have anyway. So, yeah. so again, that's that's you know, and then, as we said, like uh, you know, it's pretty. T if you listen to a lot of things, it's pretty tough life being a farmer. <laughs> you know, particularly with weather and fire and floods and everything else. You've no got... TV, and that's why they had twelve kids. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but you think back to uh, the gold spinks. You know, there was a whole team of gold spinks yeah. playing for what Cootamundra, Tumbarumba, yeah, yeah. and uh, Wilsons down at uh, Cootamundra and. And uh, the Sheemas at Hannah's Bridge, a little town yeah, between yeah, Cooler yeah. and Dunny Do, they were made up of Vern and his and his family. Um, <laughs> you know, they they were, and and then as the family sort of disintegrated, they they moved out of it. But a couple of points that Tim made that I, I'd like to uh, talk about how going forward, um, community cup competitions. We've got our groups, and uh, Matt mentioned Group Ten and Group Eleven have merged together, and now you've got teams from Lithgow to Ningen, uh, there's still some nurturing to be done in, in that and nutting out how they do it, but having gala days between them and to have Mudgie and Dubbo Sims play in a grand final. Uh, seven teams, I think, played in, in the four, four grand finals in the Peter McDonald Cup the other day. Six teams played in the Castle Ray League grand finals from league tag, reserve grade and first grade. Um, there, 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 there is a thirst for it. There's a Midwest competition, so this is for little towns like Karkor, um and uh, uh, lost the, the sheep, but uh, Grenfell, Grenfell, and, yeah, and yeah. you know little towns that don't have a team, but they're going to play a four-week competition: Candos, Ralston, Portland, um, so that people can still play rugby league and stay connected to it, but they don't have a 20-week or a 16-week competition travelling away each week. And, and let's face it, at $2.20 a, uh, a litre for petrol and diesel's dearer, you know, to, to get away, and I know New South Wales Rugby League is supporting some of the clubs, but it's very, very expensive. Mm. All right, we might take a few questions from the floor um, before we wrap up.